Hi, welcome. Um, thank you all so much for spending an hour of what is now a sunny afternoon at Amherst with us today talking about digital privacy and security. I'm Nicole Ozer from the class of 1997, and I am the Technology and Civil Liberties Policy Director at the ACLU of California. I'm a specialized lawyer within the ACLU. Sure, I'm a specialized lawyer within the ACLU, and for the past 13 years, I have developed and led our work on privacy and free speech and new technologies. So everything from government surveillance to consumer privacy to free speech and the internet. So there's a lot to talk about today. Um, certainly very timely topics um, in the news and in uh, public conversation. So um, Rick and I are gonna try and do sort of a, a big flyby on some of the major issues and we're going to try and leave some significant time at the end also for question and answer and discussion. So. Um, I'll probably scare you for 20 minutes and then hopefully give you some ideas about um, what we can actually do um, to improve the situation. So I'll pass it over to Rick to introduce himself and then I'll start off um, with a presentation. So thanks. I'm Rick Borden, uh, class of 87, uh, and I am a cybersecurity lawyer. So in my part, I'm going to scare you even more. Um, although uh, I'm not sure that I have all the answers to make you feel better. Uh, I, I was the chief technology lawyer for the Hartford for about nine years, um, and then I was the cybersecurity lawyer at Bank of America, uh, which uh, is really an incredible thing that is, uh, outside the US, people think of Bank of America like Bank of England, so it is one of the most attacked institutions in the world from a cyber standpoint. Uh, so the, uh, it's part of critical infrastructure and the cybersecurity there is just intense. Um, and then I was the chief privacy officer, cybersecurity and privacy lawyer at uh, DTCC, which is also part of financial critical infrastructure. And now I'm in private practice. So why don't we, uh, why don't we get this rolling? And uh, so, so Nicole's going to scare you all about privacy. Yes. Um, so the last time I was, I was in this room for a class, it was actually one of Austin Serrett's classes. You know he runs up and down and is very animated. I won't do that as much, but I'll at least stand up so that um, we, can, we can have a conversation together. Um, I'll use this snazzy clicker as well. Um, so... I'm gonna try and give you a big picture sense of sort of where we are with things in terms of safeguarding digital privacy in the current political and social climate. So the reality is that Trump has the keys to a massive surveillance infrastructure. Um, this surveillance infrastructure has been built for a very long time. It has been, uh, it was hardened significantly under the Obama administration, and now Trump has the keys to it. Um, it really consists of uh, numerous different segments. One is sort of the national security infrastructure. I'm sure many folks have you know, heard about Patriot Act powers, have heard about um, uh, FISA, FISA surveillance powers, warrantless wiretapping. There's, a, there's an immense amount of national security infrastructure right now in terms of both digital surveillance and physical surveillance. Um, much of that didn't have um, strong enough or robust enough protections even under the Obama administration. And now under the Trump administration, we know that many of the individuals very high up in that administration uh, think that the warrantless wiretapping program was just fine as it was. They actually would like to expand it even more and connect warrantless wiretapping information to lifestyle information and, and other types of information. They have said that they want to surveil mosques. They have said that Black Lives Matter is a threat and certainly needs to be watched. So there's a huge infrastructure in the national security space that already has had very few protections and uh, the Trump administration wants to strengthen uh, the, the powers and reduce the oversight even more. Um, the national security infrastructure has also been increasingly bleeding into federal law enforcement. 
Um, under the Obama administration, actually, NSA data was shared with the FBI, the DEA, the CIA. That's continued, so a lot of the information that for a very long time was really um, cordoned off for national security and um, to address people who were outside of the country has now been used in a lot of different ways for domestic law enforcement as well. So we've got the national security infrastructure and that bleeding into federal law enforcement. Um, we also have uh, both federal law enforcement and state law enforcement that have really extensive powers in terms of both digital surveillance and physical surveillance. Um, there has been an exponential increase in demands from law enforcement for information, our digital information that's in our emails, that's in our cloud documents. Um, just to give you an example, there's been a 250% increase in government demands to Google for information in just the past five years. Folks like AT&T and Verizon have experienced 50, 60, 70% increases in demands for things like location information in recent years. So there's been a huge amount of digital surveillance that has grown with very little oversight. Also in terms of physical surveillance, um, the federal government has sent down $1 billion a year since 2004 from the federal government, from the Department of Justice, from the Department of Homeland Security, for local communities, uh, local police, local sheriffs, to build and buy really sophisticated surveillance systems. Things like local fusion centers, stingrays, license plate readers, video cameras. Some of you uh, may live in communities where these things have popped up on streets and in, in your community in the past five to 10 years. And that's because of the very significant amount of money that has come down from the federal government to build these systems and the data that's collected about who we are and where we go, what we do, who we know, that information doesn't stay in Oakland, California, or in Brooklyn, New York, or in whatever city you live in. Much of that actually is sent up to the federal government through federal fusion centers, which are in every state in the country. California has six of them. Um, but there are 78 total around the country, and, and they pool data um, at the local level and at the state level and share it up with the federal government and vice versa. So there's a lot of data and surveillance infrastructure that's been built up just in terms of the infrastructure that the federal government themselves has built and maintained in the last decade. There's also been a lot of other changes <laughs> in the last decade. Um, when I graduated in 1997, we were living in a very different world. Um, we just started to have email. Um, it didn't really exist outside of the university context for most people. Um, we certainly didn't have cloud documents. Um, much of the kinds of information that government collected and maintained was still in paper form. It wasn't in digital form. And in the last, I guess now, 20 years, um, it's my 20th reunion this year, the com world has completely changed. So much data um, is now flowing and digitized. So we're in the middle as the individual, and whether it be our medical data, which is now digitized in um, digital medical records, whether it's all of our internet communications, our emails, our cloud documents, our photos, um, our text messages, whether it's all those public documents about our marriages, deaths, purchases, I'm sure of all the things that we are required to share with the government that used to be in folders tucked away are now digitized and really move much more rapidly through the ecosystem. Uh, the same with what we purchase and buy. So few of us probably still use cash, so really everything that we're doing is being recorded in terms of how we purchase it, either through a credit card or through PayPal or through other systems of purchases. The panel right before us was on Bitcoin, sort of a whole other level of, of retail purchasing. Um, 
And then, of course, telecommunications and mobile. I was just saying to my college roommate what a different experience it is now to walk around campus with a cell phone and be able to say, meet me in the quad in five minutes. Like, we didn't have that reality 20 years ago. Um, but what it also means is that so much more of our lives is digitized, and so much more of that data um, is flowing in a very, very complex ecosystem. Um, what the companies like Google and Facebook are collecting, what data is flowing to the third-party apps or the quizzes that you run on those platforms, um, all the data that is in the government records, that is public data, that um, data brokers are buying, selling, mining really detailed information about our lives, our families, our interests, our hobbies. This has certainly been a huge news story in the last few months about what's happened with Cambridge Analytica and the thousands of data points that they had on every American that really helped them to sort of target and think about how they were going to run uh, the Trump campaign. So the sort of very detailed information about our lives, our interests, our habits, our fears, our thoughts, um, really sort of out there in a way that is flowing in a very, very complex ecosystem that very few members of the public really understand or have any thought about how that actually could impact their lives down the line in terms of insurance, jobs, housing, um, decisions, elections. Um, mobile is, of course, another prime example. It's an entire ecosystem unto itself with all of the different players involved in where data is flowing, how it's being collected, whether it be your location information about where your phone is at every single moment, the apps you're running, the things you're searching for on your phone, um, whether or not you use something like Siri to ask, you know, where's the nearest gas station? All of that data is being collected in this additional ecosystem. And so, while a lot has changed since 1997 or 1987 in terms of the technology, what has largely remained unchanged is the digital privacy law. And I, I took a few sort of notes about sort of where we are with current laws. So HIPAA, the healthcare privacy law, uh, was passed in 1996, so before I graduated from Amherst, and, and really hasn't been updated since. Um, the Video Privacy Protection Act, some of you may remember using videotapes and going to actually rent video cassettes. Um, there was a special law passed about that in 1988. It's really one of the, the last laws that really looks at a specific area of new technology and how to protect the privacy of that information about who you are and what you're watching. Um, the Telecommunications Act, um, Section 222, is uh, from 1996, and it's really the law that's the most modern law related to telecommunications. It's what's actually at stake um, when we're talking right now about broadband privacy and net neutrality. They're talking about a law and how to interpret a law that's more than 20 years old and was really based on concepts of how to define things like um, what was a uh, information service and what was a telecommunication service. Information service was something like Prodigy, which if I asked most Amherst students now, they would have never even heard of this service. And that's what we're still kind of fitting new technology into these um, statutory laws that just don't even make sense anymore. And one that I've worked on quite a bit, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act of 1986. Um, that is the law that's supposed to safeguard and create limits for when the government can reach in and demand information from companies, information about um, what we're communicating about and who we're communicating to. That law has not been updated since 1986. It does not consider uh, location information. It doesn't consider cloud computing. It was passed at a time when Congress couldn't even fathom that we would keep our email longer than 180 days um, because storage was so expensive that they thought if you kept email for longer than six months, 
um, it must be that you really didn't care about it and you threw it away because you couldn't access it ever again. Um, and so the current uh, federal law actually, you lose warrant protection for email that's over six months, this 180 day rule. So we have this law that's incredibly outdated um, that doesn't really consider sort of the modern digital world. Um, and the government has really taken advantage of many of these outdated laws to engage in very widespread uh, demands uh, to companies uh, without a warrant for very sensitive information about our lives. So on the consumer privacy side, it really isn't any better. Um, as I said, HIPAA is 1996, BPPA is 1988. We don't have the kind of comprehensive privacy laws on the books that the EU has, and these um, sectoral um, patchwork laws, most of them are 20 to 30 years old. So it, it really leaves a huge hole in terms of uh, protections for privacy, both in terms of what the government themselves does and how they utilize and access information that we have shared with companies um, and never sort of envisioned or intended that the government would have access to this data, uh, particularly without even going to a judge and showing a good reason. Uh, most of this data is, is often accessible with just a subpoena uh, that never gets judicial oversight or review. So a couple of things that have happened in, in the last couple of years, there's certainly been an attempt um, to, to look at um, ways that we can use existing law to address new technology. As most of you know, Congress has been a very difficult place to get anything done, even in the last eight years, and um, has become an even more difficult place now. So there's been a lot of attempts in the recent years to at least look at the laws that are already on the books and think about how we can create new, um, how we can create protections within the context of those laws. Those are two of the things that the FCC has done in recent years um, related to both broadband privacy and net neutrality. Now, how many of you all have sort of been following some of the federal conversations or in the news about broadband privacy or net neutrality? So folks are pretty familiar with this. So the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, in the last three years has done two pretty substantial rulemakings. Uh, one was on broadband privacy and one was on net neutrality. Uh, net neutrality, they created um, the open internet rules. They looked at the Telecommunications Act of 1996 and said, you know, we're going to make sure that people have access to the open internet. And they created the open internet rules that said um, no broadband providers can censor content. They can't stop you from seeing certain types of things. Um, they can't slow down certain content. They can't, quote, throttle certain things. Like if you're trying to look at video, they can't slow that down. Um, and that was really sort of similar to the telephone. It's not like on the telephone that your telephone provider can say, well, you're allowed to talk to this person, but you're not allowed to talk to this person. Or if you have a conversation about this issue, um, we're going to make it jumbled and you can't hear anyone as well. So it was really about creating um, standards that were um, equivalent for broadband as they were for telephone access. Um, so that was one important rulemaking that was done in the last couple of years. And the second was for broadband privacy to say that um, if you are a broadband provider that um, you you can, you can collect certain information to provide broadband service, but you can't sell or use that information in other ways unless you have the opt-in consent of the user. Um, and that was building on uh, statutory, uh, statutory authority that the FCC had to protect um, proprietary network information, customer information, and to say, look, broadband providers, you can't sell or use data about the content of what people are looking at, um, what apps they're using, uh, without their consent. So these were two important rulemakings that happened in the last couple of years, both of which um, probably people are familiar that um, Congress rolled back the broadband privacy rules just in the last couple of months. Um, they said that 
the FCC could not create rules where they said that broadband was like a telephone. They weren't allowed to do that anymore, to use that section of the Communications um, Act. And the second was that they've said they are also now going to reclassify broadband as not telecommunications, and that would really take away the non-discrimination provisions that um, undergird the net neutrality rules. So what has sort of the advances that have, have happened, minimal as they are in the last couple of years, the Trump administration is really um, attacking them. The third piece I'll just talk about that I alluded to very quickly at the beginning is just the fact that there is, in addition to the digital surveillance systems, there are really expansive surveillance systems on the streets. Um, I work very closely on these issues, particularly in California, where we see um, billions of dollars come into local communities, and also particularly in border communities. We see a lot of this surveillance technology that is uh, deployed for terrorism and funded for terrorism, but actually ends up getting used almost never for terrorism. There was just a story very recently out of Detroit where a Stingray cell tracker, which is a surveillance device that actually allows the device to mimic a cell tower, and it, it makes your phone communicate with it and tell it where it is. This Stingray was purchased for terrorism, um, but was recently exposed that it's actually being used um, to, to find and deport immigrants. So we see it in um, drug cases, we see it in domestic cases, and now we're starting to see it in immigration cases. So there's a lot of work that we're doing to sort of um, expose issues of surveillance and, and try and make sure that there's stronger uh, transparency and oversight at the local level. So just to let you know a little bit of what we are doing, I mentioned sort of the Stingray issue. Um, we have some large campaigns happening at the ACLU to bring back in transparency and accountability and oversight for local surveillance, including passing surveillance ordinances at the local level. Um, the first one passed in Santa Clara County that I worked on. There's one moving in Oakland, and now there are surveillance ordinances moving in about 20 cities across the country. Um, we were able to stop a stingray in Santa Clara County by exposing um, what they were and what they would be doing and, and the secrecy that was around it. Um, another thing that we were able to do was expose social media surveillance that was happening nationwide. We found that over a thousand police departments were using social media surveillance systems that were specifically targeting activists and activists of color. Um, they had characterized unions and protesters as overt threats um, and were really focusing in on activists. Um, and it turned out that they had secret data deals with Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, um, which was allowing this data to happen. So we did a large campaign and actually cut off the data flows from these big companies um, to, these, to these surveillance systems, um, including having Facebook and Twitter and Instagram change their policies. Um, they now have policies which say no data can be used to build surveillance systems. And the third was I mentioned ECPA the federal law from 1986 uh, that is woefully out of date. In California, I was able to um, help to pass CALECBA, which is the strongest digital privacy law in the world. Um, it requires any California government entity to obtain a warrant to search any cell phones or to demand any information from companies like Google or Facebook. And this has become a model for many other states around the nation to introduce similar laws. And what we hoped would um, jumpstart a federal effort again as well, although in the current um, congressional climate, it's most unlikely that there will be federal effort and much more likely that there will be state effort. Um, the last thing I'll just say is so we don't sort of end on a low note. Um, you know, we're doing a lot in terms of federal legislative and administrative defense um, in terms of the uh, net neutrality. There are now comments being submitted. There have been over two million comments submitted to the FCC about net neutrality, and we're organizing major campaigns to try and make sure that net neutrality standards stay in effect. 
Um, there are also now 17 states that have introduced uh, broadband privacy legislation to um, fill in the gap of what has been reversed on the congressional level. Um, as I said, Cal ECPA was an effort we did on the state level as well, and there are now seven or eight states which have introduced something similar. So state legislation is an area where things are moving very proactively. Um, they have been for a while. Things like data breach notification, the reason why you see a privacy policy on websites, those are all because of state legislation, much of it that started in California. Um, also, local policy change. Issues of surveillance. Um, surveillance systems can't be put in local communities without actually some kind of vote by local law enforcement and by local uh, supervisors and, and, and city councils. So we're putting in ordinances in place um, to make sure that those conversations happen appropriately and that communities are really involved. And then litigation, um, I'll talk more about this when we get to the issues of what can be done, but I'm sure many people have seen the news about um, uh, searches of devices at the border. Um, so people coming through the border, um, if you're coming back from an international trip, a lot of, there have been 5,000 uh, searches of cell phones at the border in February alone, which was more than all of 2015 combined. And this is a very active area of potential litigation that the ACLU is doing, so we'll talk more about that issue. Um, and then working with the companies, I work very closely with all the major tech companies uh, to try and push and advocate and encourage and support uh, much stronger standards at the company level um, to better protect against government surveillance and also consumer privacy. We've also done shareholder proposals against companies to demand stronger privacy. So we're working on many different um, strategies and tactics to address sort of what as you see is an, a situation where there's been an exponential increase in uh, technology in the past 20 years, but the law has moved far more slowly and it's left huge, huge holes in terms of protections for our information, both from the government and on the consumer privacy side. So that's a beginning and I will pass it to Rick to talk about cybersecurity and then we'll have some time um, to talk about some practical ways that you can address some of these issues as well as other ways to get engaged in um, pushing for change that's happening on the local and state and federal level, and then we'll leave time for questions. Okay. so. We're going to go from the area where there's bad law to the area where there's no law. So let me ask a question. How many of you believe that your biggest risk with your bank is identity theft? That's it? Okay. How many of you believe that it, the biggest risk is that your money will be stolen? From the, by the bank, from the bank. So that somebody will steal your money out of your bank. Okay, there are protections for that. You actually, if somebody steals your money out of the bank, the bank actually has to, to give it back. Privacy is a big problem. That's not the biggest thing. What if your bank was unavailable for a day? What if it was unavailable for a week? How about six months? Okay. Include your brokerage account with that. Okay, this is actually real. Now, think about the electric grid. What if that was unavailable? There are 16 sectors of critical infrastructure in, this com in the country. Virtually all of it is owned by the private sector. So this isn't the government. And there is no regulation on this right now, or virtually none. There's actually a new regulation in, in New York. So. What's the current state? Risk. We've got a lot of risk. We've got uh, outsourcing of uh, technology. So companies uh, own some, they outsource. There's stuff all over. You've got the cloud, which actually in some cases may be more secure 
but you've got information all in different places, all these things all going on at the same time. The consumerization of, uh, of all of this is really intense. Think about what you have on your phone now, right? So, but if your phone was taken out, right? We've seen ransomware, we'll talk a little bit about that. What if your phone was gone? You couldn't use that, all of the information, all the stuff that you have on there. Um, and social media, oh man, social media is bad, okay? Now, you've heard how social media can be used from a privacy standpoint, now, believe me, the government having that information, not good. The companies having that information, they know everything about you. They know who's gonna announce, who, who's going to get married before the proposal's been made. They do, right? So they, they know who's pregnant before they've told their partner, they know there's so much that they know and have. And that information is being used against people and companies by the threat actors. They get information, that's when you get that email that looks really good, that has information about you or about some, somebody that you know, it looks right, has that attachment, has that link, you click on it, you've got ransomware, you've been taken over. You've been hacked, you may not know you've been hacked, your computer may not be a bot, it's part of a botnet. So, types of targets, basically, everybody. I mean, medical, healthcare, we just saw, and, and we've been seeing this, we saw a group of hospitals at the NIH in, in the UK get taken down by the ransomware, they had to turn away patients. We've had that here in the US. There was a hospital in Baltimore that uh, got hacked. A friend of a friend was going in for stage four cancer treatment one day, couldn't go in. That electronic medical record that we worry about the privacy on, it wasn't available. They couldn't get the treatment, it got turned away. Had to go to a different hospital somewhere. I mean, it was a disaster. And this, this is what we're starting to see. You had educational breaches. That's happening all over the place. They're using that information to try to get to companies, to try to get to other places. It, it is, and, and the people who are doing it, which we'll, we'll talk about in a second, this is a business. I mean, they're, it's, it's either a business or uh, they have uh, reasons that they want to harm us. So financial institutions are, are being breached. Small businesses now are real targets, and uh, they don't have the ability to protect themselves almost at all. And energy and utility, that is happening. There is malware on the electric grid, on control systems on the electric grid. We know it. They can't get rid of it, but somebody put it there, some nation state most likely, and it can download a payload that will then be used at some point. For what, we don't know, but you can imagine what it might be. So the types of threats, email phishing threats are huge now. So um, something about, I think, over 90% of spam emails, uh, or 90% of phishing emails are ransomware. A ton of the spam are phishing emails. Um, malware, the type, of, the type of stuff that we're seeing out there now has changed. It's adaptive. So this WannaCry uh, uh, ransomware, this thing that came out of the NSA, interestingly, they found an exploit, created a really interesting worm to go along with it, something that so what it does is once it gets in, you get into one place in a company, right? And it then finds its way to every other computer that's of the right type. And it, nobody else needs to have done anything. Just finds its way through, 
and bam, hits. It's, it's really very, very sophisticated. And by the way, you can buy ransomware as a service now from Russia. No, no, seriously. It's, it costs about $4,000 a month. They provide the servers, the emails. You can customize emails so that you can make them better. Um, they, the, whole, the whole thing, the, the way to take in the money, they, just, they charge you also a little percentage of uh, what you take in. Read an analysis of the uh, economics of it. Actually, it makes great economic sense to, to rent your malware. You don't have to have any tech expertise at all. Uh, social media threats. Social, uh, social media, it's just, I'm telling you, it's just bad. It's just really, really bad. Not just that we put all of our information out there, it is a threat vector, right? I, I look at Facebook now. I stopped looking at Facebook for like almost a year. I look at it now. I don't put anything on there. I put some stuff on LinkedIn, really just articles. There's information about me there, probably more than I would like. Um, and uh, I, I don't use Instagram. Uh, I'll read stuff. I don't put, I don't put information out there. Um, and then mobile threats. They're taking over phones. They get all your information off your phone. You've got more information on your phone. Your phone is a supercomputer. You've got more information on your phone than you do anywhere else, and that stuff can be used against you. There are protections that you can use to some extent, but not tremendously good ones. If you're being targeted, you're, you're going to get hacked. So who is it? Who's doing it? Well, if you're a company, maybe your competitors. That's happening. They may try to get information, so theft of, uh, of intellectual property is happening. The, certainly, uh, when we talk about foreign intelligence services, nation states, theft of intellectual property, um, you know, one of the, there was a government official who said that the uh, theft by the Chinese of intellectual property from the U.S. is the largest wealth transfer in the history of the world. We really don't have a good way to stop that. We don't have a good way to know either exactly how much of it's happened. Um, and foreign intelligence services are also looking to do other things. We've seen this with the election. We know that Russia is playing around with elections. They did it here in the US. They've been doing it in Europe. Whether you, I don't care which side of the political spectrum you're on, this should worry you. Because they'll go after one, they'll go after another. Who, how should they be the ones helping to decide what happens? And they pushed information out that was false on different candidates. They helped pick the candidates, right? That's not what we want for our society. You've got hacktivists. They do things for whatever political or social reason they want. And it may be anarchists. It may be people who are anti-abortion. It may be people who are pro-abortion. It may be whatever. They go out, and they have an agenda, and they can buy tools, buy tools now, get free tools, and use them to create attacks against the people who they don't like. Uh, employees, so the insiders are the biggest threats that company have, companies have. Because they have the access, they have the information, they know how the systems work. And that's why phishing attacks are big, because then you take an insider who may not be malicious and make them one of the threat vectors by taking them over. And then you've got just plain hackers. So interestingly, 69% of companies report theft or tax from malicious insiders. 69% of them. And yet, 9% say that their insider threat programs are effective. And I would tell you that number is too high. Those people don't know how ineffective their programs are. Having an effective insider threat program is extraordinarily difficult these days. So some of the things that have been in the news, you've had Stuxnet. Stuxnet was a game changer. Hey, we did this, right? We threw this out there. We took out 
and caused physical damage to Iran's nuclear infrastructure using a sophisticated cyber attack against computers that were not connected to the internet. That technology is now out there and in use against us and has been upgraded and is far more effective than it was back then. We saw the ransomware, the, the, the WannaCry ransomware attack, uh, over 200,000, I now am hearing 300,000, 150 countries. We're very lucky it got stopped by a researcher who found a, this very strange thing that actually stopped the whole thing in its tracks. There are uh, some variations of that that have been reported out there. Uh, and the expectation is we are going to see the WannaCry 2.0 or some other things coming out that are going to take that and make that far more rampant. Here in the US, we got lucky because they caught it before um, uh, the uh, work started for the day in the US. So we got, we got just tremendously lucky here. Um, there are state-sponsored uh, espionage against European banks. There also have been, um, I'll say, uh, in the Ukraine, their electric grid was taken out twice by, let's say, some country who may not necessarily be happy with them. The interesting thing is that they were actually able to turn their grid back on because they went, they took people and sent them out to the substations. Now, by the way, they're watching on their screens, they're watching the cursor go like this and click to turn the things off. And they can't stop it. It's, it's going on in front of them. So they send people out to the substations. They're lucky because the substations had this switch. And they went like that with the switch and they were able to turn the substation back on. We have more modern switches, our more modern substations. Ours don't have those switches. Our electric grid gets taken out by an attack like that. It's not getting turned on so quick. And if something is done that causes physical damage, the way that you know they Stuxnet spun up these uh, uh, centrifuges, caused them to to actually break. I mean, these things can happen. There was a dam that was attacked theoretically by Iran. Luckily, one computer was offline. Uh, otherwise, they could have opened the dam. This was in upstate New York. Not that they necessarily would have. Um, and cyber criminals have attacked, are attacking our financial system. They, they actually attacked the, uh, the method of uh, moving money within uh, and around the Federal Reserve. It's just, it's, it's amazing. So this is a couple years old now. But uh, it just gives you an idea of cyber crime, right? The kind of the scale, $108 billion in the US, that, that is, it's probably doubled at this point in the last two years. Um, but this just gives you an idea of like percentages of GDP that cyber crime is, is causing. So, okay, so what do you do? Right? What, what do you do? Well, information security professionals look at protection uh, in layers and in depth. And information security is a process. It is a whole series of controls that need to be put in place. And you have to understand your infrastructure. You have to understand your data. You need to know where your data is, what data is important. What systems are important? Where they're located? Are they with third parties? Do you have them? Who controls them? Where are the weak points? And you put controls in all the places and you test the controls. Sounds very easy. It is extremely difficult. So the questions we ask, are you, you know, are you prepared to prevent this? Unique malware samples that are coming out daily. So they're not caught by the antivirus necessarily. Organizations are hit by advanced persistent threats. So the average amount of time, 
at least this was uh, as of a few months ago, the average amount of time, once somebody is into a company's systems, before they're discovered, is 229 days. Right. So they, are, they go in and they figure out what's happening. They go and they map it all out. They do it very quietly. These are highly sophisticated attacks. So when you get hit with an advanced persistent threat, when companies get hit with them, when uh, a, uh, a electrical facility, when logistics companies get hit with them, they can get taken out, right? At some point, some company is going to go, they're, they're gonna go out of business because of a cyber attack. Somebody's gonna be put out of business. And we hope that when that happens, it's not something that causes cascade effects and causes people to die or be injured or be seriously harmed in, in other ways. Um, mobile malware is growing. There, there are these things called rootkit attacks. Um, subverting digital signatures. <laughs> that one, these are the certificates that show that this website is the appropriate website. That uh, when you send an, an email or send a message and you think it's encrypted, that it's actually going to the person that you think is going to it, and that they're the only ones who can read it. So iMessage, by the way, you send something on iMessage between uh, two iPhones, it's encrypted end to end. But not if the certificate's been uh, subverted somehow. Um, the fastest growing non-mobile malware is ransomware. Um, and they're the, the techniques uh, to get this stuff on there and have it be effective are becoming more and more advanced. Artificial intelligence is starting to become part of this. So this is kind of how, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, this is how a strategy that, um, and this is very, very basic strategy based on something called the Cybersecurity Framework for Critical Infrastructure, which uh, was part of an executive order from the Obama administration um, to, to think about uh, how you put protections in place and how you know whether your protections are effective. Um, it's, it's being used, there are a bunch of companies that are using it. It's still not, uh, it's not a, not a great situation out there. And so this one, I'm not gonna really go through this, but this is the, these are the questions that companies really need to ask and people who are on boards of companies or are officers uh, or who are running companies themselves, you need to ask these questions. Um, and this will help you get to an idea of whether or not um, you're protected. So from my view, while I, I'm a privacy lawyer also, uh, so I'm concerned about, I'm concerned about privacy, um, but I've learned far too much about cybersecurity at this point. So I think we really don't have, I think we've given up privacy mostly to, uh, you know, in the EU, privacy is a fundamental human right. Here, we don't have that, and we're not fighting for that. We've decided as a society not to fight for that for whatever reason. Um, but security, security, there, there's, a, there's one regulation that just came out in New York for banks and um, insurance companies and mortgage companies. Uh, so it's the first real cybersecurity regulation in the US. The first one. So we're about 15 years behind where privacy was, where the states started to put in place privacy laws. And it's coming at the state level at this point on security because the federal government is unable to move in the same way. And in this one, you, you have the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. So, you, yeah, if you are able to find that person in Ukraine or you know, China or wherever, if you're able to find them and you're able to get them to, uh, to, 
to a place where you could extradite them, you could actually you know, maybe do something about it, but the chances of that are low. We used to say that it was the you can't go to Disney um, situation. So, you know, they uh, charged some people in China uh, who were theoretically part of a government um, entity for an attack here in the US, but there's now Shanghai Disney, so that doesn't even apply. Uh, so the, so while, um, while Nicole has, you know, some, some ideas about the positive, uh, I'm, I'm a little more cynical at this point, um, simply because the threats are increasing with the Internet of Things, all these connected devices, everything I see out there is a threat vector, mm -hmm. right? Every connected device that you have, every time you put a light bulb in that you can dim with your phone, a doorbell that you can answer your door, um, anything out there that you have that is connected to the internet is then a, a threat vector in. So hospitals, um, they've got connected devices all over, not just on, on the medical equipment, but anything that you buy these days has a connection to the internet. Target was hacked because of their HVAC vendor. Right? It, guess what? Big, you know, HVAC systems, they actually report back on the internet about whether or not they're working well. So there's a reason for them to be connected. So it is getting more and more complicated as technology increases and as it becomes a more, even more of a part of our lives, the security aspect is getting worse and, and becoming more intense. People realize it, there are a lot of people trying to do things about it, um, but it's not a concerted effort, and it's not very coordinated right now. So that's where we are. And I think one of the sort of core issues is the public sort of understanding these threat models in terms of privacy and security because there are ways that stronger protections for privacy and security can both be baked into the system at the beginning um, and also sort of push back in terms of what kind of auxiliary protections there are. Like, are there ways for you to physically turn something off or on? Um, you know, deciding as a consumer whether or not it's good to have a connected toaster or a connected thermostat or something else. Um, you know, what, what are the costs and what are the benefits? And there's a lot of sort of lack of information in terms of the public sort of understanding well, what are the benefits of this, but what are the real costs? Um, you know, a product that's marketed as, quote, free, what are the, actually the data costs of that? Or, oh, when, or when, when, when it's free, by the way, right. you're the product. That's right. I, I tell people, no, seriously. Yeah, there is no such thing as free. If, it, if you're not paying with your money, you're paying with your data. Yeah. Um, and most of the time, it's more expensive than they would ever be able to market it for actual money. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But no, you're, when you think about yourself as the product, I mean, look, and I use Gmail all the time, so I'm a product. But that's, that's what we are. And that's what we are to many of these companies. And we want everything for free. We want everything for free, right? We want uh, information for free. So we don't want to pay for newspapers anymore. We want everything for free. So when that happens, they got to make money somehow. Otherwise, that stuff's not going to be there. And the more that you give out, the more privacy you give up, and the more security you give up. Both. And, and I think that you know we see a lot of we see a lot of, um, of privacy protections actually coming out of California, not just because that's where the technology companies are, but you know Rick's sort of saying like what is our attitude to privacy and um, to what is our viewpoint on privacy? California actually has a constitutional right to privacy. Um, that applies to both the government and to private parties. So it's broader than the Fourth Amendment. The Fourth Amendment, the Constitution, the Federal Fourth Amendment 
um, protects you against the government, but it doesn't create sort of this baseline in terms of privacy against private actors. But the California Constitution was amended in the 1970s by the voters to particularly address the modern threat to privacy in terms of the technological revolution and data and databases. And so it applies both to the government and to private parties. And that is a lot of the work that I do um, in terms of building privacy protections in statutory law that are based on that inalienable right to privacy, that guarantee not just to government, not just to privacy against the government, but to our own control over our personal information. So that's why you see things like data breach notification laws coming out of California, financial privacy laws coming out of California, student privacy laws coming out of California, genetic. Calecba, genetic privacy laws coming out of California, because California is actually the closest to the EU concepts of consumer privacy of anywhere in the country. There are also a couple of other states who have constitutional rights to privacy, Washington State um, and a few others, but there's a very, very different concept of what we as um, Californians are, uh, are expect and are guaranteed in terms of privacy, and that's something that um, we, we sort of build on every day. Yeah, and so, the, so I, we'll see we have a question, but I just want to make one comment on that, so, or two. Um, so note that California, which is where the Silicon Valley is, heart of innovation in, in technology, um, is the state that has these, these laws, the constitutional right, the regulations. A lot of people claim that uh, it will stifle innovation. Does not have to be the case. Um, and this is not a liberal versus conservative. This is not, uh, you know, it, it really isn't. Um, privacy is just as important on the conservative side as it is on the liberal side. Everybody is concerned about their personal information, how the government can use it, how other parties can use it. So, but this is something that uh, we need to work on every day in order to make sure that, uh, that things don't erode further because it's, pretty, it's in a pretty bad place right now. And I would just say that for folks who do want to get engaged or involved, states are a great place to do this. Um, you know, they're the only place to do well, it. Well, yeah, and and small states and big states. I mean, there have been major, very significant privacy laws coming out of New Hampshire. There have been significant privacy laws coming out of Utah. Talking about sort of the right left. Um, coalitions. The New Hampshire laws have been introduced by a very conservative Republican. Laws we've done in California have been similarly co-sponsored on both sides of the aisle. So regardless of where you live in the country, there are probably some, as I said, 17 states have already moved forward broadband privacy laws to sort of fill the gap of what the federal government has done. There's just been a bill introduced in Congress that would stop states from taking action on broadband privacy. So I would say the couple, the two really important federal actions right now are one um, to fight back against uh, net neutrality being decimated. It's both a freedom of expression issue in terms of being able to get access to information that you want to get access to. For you, know, this isn't hypothetical. Um, Verizon tried to stop people from accessing content that was uh, opposing changes to net neutrality. A Canadian ISP tried to stop a labor union from accessing a website um, about issues against them. So this issue of making sure that content gets to people and that there can't be um, prioritization of certain content over other content, because you know it's going to be activist content that is stopped. So it's a very important from a freedom of expression standpoint, but it's also important from a surveillance standpoint because if you're going to be censoring certain content or prioritizing certain content, it means you're going to be monitoring all content. So it's important from both a freedom of expression and a privacy standpoint to maintain strong protections for net neutrality. So we we'll have- questions. Uh, 
Um, how did bought the house out in the uh, with you know next to a lake uh, with some farmland yet? But considering that, but otherwise, um, I, I run a VPN on my phone, uh, iPad, and a virtual private network. You can get these really pretty cheaply. You have to know who you're getting it from so that it, it actually has some level of security. So if I connect to an unknown Wi-Fi, um, unsecured Wi-Fi, it's all encrypted. Nobody can read it. Um, I use a password manager. Uh, one password, last pass, dash lane. Um, so my uh, passwords are all over 20 characters. I'm now starting to do over 23 characters and symbols long. Um, uh, I, I don't use uh, certain, uh, you know, certain uh, social media. Um, I am very careful about the location services that actually that the apps on my phone are able to use. Um, so I, I don't use the Uber app itself now because that will track me for about 10 minutes after I get off so it knows where you're going after you get out of the car. Um, so now I'm using Lyft or I use uh, Uber through Google Maps um, so that it won't be able to do that. Um, so there's a whole host of little, huh? Online banking, yeah, sure. Online banking, yeah, uh, because there's a guarantee. There's an online banking guarantee. Having worked at a having worked at a bank, one, those are fairly hardened systems. However, I do have uh, we, my my wife and I do have um, a bank account at a small uh, bank. Uh, where we do not do online banking, and we have a certain amount of money in there, um, in case that online, you know, in case our main bank uh, gets attacked somehow, and uh, you know, we need to pay bills and, and do that. So uh, we do have that that secondary thing. No, um, I mean, the, the reality is that there's market pressure still. Um, and as I said, 17 states have introduced, sort of echoing the things that were in the federal um, broadband privacy rules. Um, but disaggregated the, personal search histories? I mean, the FCC still has jurisdiction to protect um, you know, consumer proprietary, proprietary network information until the FCC chair, if he's successful in reclassifying broadband as Title I information service. It's a little weedy, but um, currently the FCC still has that jurisdiction to, um, to enforce that. So I would say there are, no, there are no congressional laws, there's no rulemaking right now, but um, we will hopefully see some ways to address that in the future. And there's market pressure. So, you know, market pressure goes a long way. Um, we're able to accomplish a lot through market pressure and public pressure on companies who want to, you know, we're their customers. And in broadband, you're actually paying with money. So you know, you're paying a lot of money. And now they say, well, we want your data too. I mean, as sort of a, a market situation, you know, there's a lot of pressure we can, we can right. bring to so bear. So each, each of them has announced that there are certain things that they're not going to do, even if the net neutrality is, uh, is really pulled back the way that, they're, that it looks like it will be. So there, there, there's a lot, I mean, there is a lot of information out there uh, I mean, yeah. I mean, you could you can Google. No, no, Google's Google's. It, it's actually it's it's actually okay. You'd be you'd be surprised. Although, uh, if you're really worried about it, use DuckDuckGo, because um, that that doesn't capture your search history. Uh, the search algorithm isn't quite as good as Google. So I do use Google for. I, but for something like this, you know, how do I protect myself online, um, or you know, something like that, I don't. That Google search is fine. I'm fine having that one out and, there. And the ACLU has some resources. Um, also, we work 
very often with the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which is also based in San Francisco, and they have a great document called Surveillance Self-Defense. So there's a lot of materials there. Um, there's also some really good materials online that we've done and both EFF have done in terms of digital searches at the border. So for those of us that are traveling this summer, yeah. it's a really important and issue from both a consumer and an employee context. Also, if you're using a major bank, and we, we're, we're out of time here, but if you're using a major bank, they probably have some stuff online to help you with the privacy and security. Um, they put a lot of information out on there. Uh, you'll, you'll find that a lot of the uh, uh, the big companies that you're dealing with that are, you know, that have concern about it, they're, they're, they have collected a lot of information from that. So um, that's it. But so we've we've got to stop because there's a performance coming on after us. But we'll go out in the hall, and if and, you have any additional questions, we'll, we'll right. answer them. Thank you for coming.